afternoon and welcome. I understand that some of you came especially for this particular discussion, so thank you very much for the interest that you've shown in this, and there will be some good time for question and answer, so we're looking forward to a good conversation. As we meet today, I'm sure all of us are aware that our First Amendment provides us in the United States the ability to engage in public debate and to do so, as our Supreme Court calls it, in a very robust manner. But I'm here today in solidarity with my very dear friends in France. Um, I have lawyer and judge and think tank free speech friends uh, who have been working actively for the last five, seven, eight years um, to see speech expanded in, in Europe in general but to see what's happened and to understand that right now there is a tremendous display of support for free speech but their laws are very different than ours and because this cartoon idea fit a small niche of expression that was allowed but france it, it there's a very different climate and so we have much to be thankful for when it comes to our first amendment and all of our constitutional protections so as, as we talk today, that, that's kind of an important backdrop for us to consider, one that we vigilantly fight to protect what we still have, but that we begin to retake and reclaim ground for some of the protections and freedoms that we've lost. The U.S. Constitution is not just founding law, but it is our governing charter, and it frames our consensual agreement with our, governor, our government and governors. It gives structure to our relationship with governing officials and laws, and it provides a necessary backstop. It declares our state of individual liberty and recognizes our fundamental inalienable rights. The debate over whether it is wise for states to call a convention to amend the Constitution centers on whether it is risky to consider adding amendments, yet what this debate often fails to consider is that the Constitution has already been changed and it has been altered dramatically. Executive abuse of power, congressional negligence, and judicial abdication have all led to incremental and finally substantial revisions. In fact, the founders would be shocked at how constitutional structure has been weakened. Freedom, liberty, and opportunity are more at risk with every abridgment of the separation of powers and violation of the Tenth Amendment. To leave the Constitution alone in the current condition is to concede all that has been lost, unless Americans are willing to bet that Congress will show dramatically more resolve. The courts are not likely to change course considering the existing trends. Pro progressive judges believe in legislating from the bench, and originalist judges often believe the right course is to defer to Congress. Just the debate and organizational activities surrounding a movement to reinforce the Constitution and to restore checks and balances that would safeguard against executive and agency power takings would provide notice to Congress and the President that Americans are serious. The threat of a convention works. We were only one state away from calling a convention for a balanced budget amendment under President Reagan when Congress moved to preempt the convention by proposing its own reforms, which is, we've all noticed and, and do know, did not work. Um, the country moved to adopt much of what was discussed in the Equal Rights Amendment as a result of other intense debates. If this is not the time for a compelling Congress to, not the time for compelling Congress to act by ensuring that the American people will move the states to convention if Congress does not, then Article 5 is a hollow promise. Consider what would have been if the early colonists who became our framers and founders had not had the courage to make the case for liberty the case that has reverberated through our Declaration of Independence. What if they did not believe that they could convince their friends and neighbors that the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness according to their consciences was worth the terrible risk they faced? I'm going to close my introductory remarks now by quoting a passage from the book by Mark Levin, Liberty Amendments. And he had Alexis de Tocqueville who wrote much about our founding in mind when he wrote this. However, it is not asking too much of a great people to turn a calm and scrutinizing eye upon itself and to rally to their own salvation. It is time to return to self-government where the people are sovereign and not subjects and can reclaim some control over their future rather than accept as inevitable a dismal fate. 
Unlike the radicalism of the governing masterminds who self-servingly oversee a century-old perpetual counter-revolution against the American dawn, the people must have as their goal the reestablishment of founding principles and the restoration of constitutional republicanism, thereby nurturing the individual and preserving the civil society. This requires first an acknowledgement of the federal government's unmooring from its constitutional foundation, second an acceptance that the condition is urgent, and if untreated will ultimately be the death knell of the American Republic. Third, the wisdom to rebalance the government in a way that is without novelty and true to the framers' original, pur the framers original purpose. And fourth, the courage to confront intellectually and politically the status stubborn grip on power. I have said often that over the next two years, the states will be the conscience of Congress because the states will have to provide the conviction and the sense of resolve that Congress will need to face the challenges. As we, we discuss the challenges today and, and the possible solutions, um, we have people mm -hmm. here who have actually begun working and organizing toward a convention. Um, the first two speakers will be involved in initiatives to move toward a, a convention, a call to convention. And then our third speaker today is a professor, um, a scholar, constitutional scholar, who will tell us more about the history and the philosophy of the idea of an Article V convention. And then our fourth speaker is a representative in Texas who can tell us about some of the political work that's been done to organize. So I'm going to introduce the speakers in order and then just let them speak either from their seats um, and sharing microphones. I've tested them so those you can move back and forth or you can come to the podium if you wish. And so as I introduce them, then I will just let them speak in series so that I'm not interrupting them as we move from one to the next. So first of all, we have Ramon Bueller to my right, your left. Ramon is the national director of the Madison Coalition, working to restore a balance of state and federal power. And now Mr. Bueller serves, excuse me, Mr. Bueller served in the past from 1989 to 2003 and again in 2007 as elections counsel to the Committee on House Administration handling election integrity issues. He, among his other recent projects are legislation to speed the delivery of military ballots home from overseas and a military voting rights rule unanimously adopted by the 2012 Republican National Convention Rules Committee. And Mar uh, Roman will be sharing more about the initiative he's currently working on uh, when he speaks. Mark Meckler is sitting next to Ramon. Mark is founder and president for Citizens of Self-Governance. He's leading the call to a convention of states. He was co-founder of the Tea Party Patriots and served as the national coordinator. Mark appears regularly on television in outlets as diverse as, and I won't list them because Mark has been on everything and is everywhere. But importantly, you can also follow his blog at markmeckler.com. So that's, that's going to be interesting for a lot of us who are becoming active in this movement. Mark is a lawyer by training, and in the last 11 years of his legal career, he specialized in, in internet advertising law. And I would be remiss to not introduce Tamara Colbert, who is in the room. Where are you, Tamara? Okay, everybody's been asking where she is. She is the Texas director for the Convention of States. Professor Randy Barnett directs the Georgetown University School of Law Center for the Constitution. By the way, he got up very early. It was very cold in D.C. when he flew out. His flight was delayed, so we're very happy he did make the sacrifice and did make it here. In 2011 and 12, he represented the National Federation of Independent Business and its constitutional, in its constitutional challenge to Obamacare. He is also known for arguing the medical marijuana case of Gonzales v. Reich. I also do know that he was a very popular speaker on the law school campuses even before he became known as a marijuana um, Supreme Court <laughs> arguer. He, um, I was a Federalist Society student chapter president and um, knowing that as we invited Professor Barnett, he always could ar articulate constitutional principles in a way that were very understandable and relevant um, to young people. So he is a very popular speaker. Professor Barnett's publications include more than 100 articles and reviews, as well as nine books, including Restoring the Lost Constitution, a great book, and The Structure of Liberty. And you also can find his opinion in all of the newspapers, and he is featured on the media outlets. 
By the way, um, I wanted to mention really quickly that an AP government class in North Carolina decided to do a convention of states kind of idea based on Randy's writing. And so they contacted Professor Barnett to let, uh, the teachers did, to let him know that the students had deb debated things like unfunded mandates and had no idea what something like that was until they began to discuss it and debate the idea of amending the Constitution. And then we have Representative Paul Workman. Representative Workman is the conservative state representative for Southern and Western Travis County, serving District 47 in the Texas House of Representatives since 2011. Representative Workman is a member of the House Committee on Business and Industry and the House Committee on Economic and Small Business Development. He also serves as a member on the um, Energy Council. And uh, he has been named Legislator of the Year by the Real Estate Council of Austin and a Lone Star Conservative Leader by Texas Conservative Roundtable and a Fighter for Free Enterprise by the Texas Association of Business. Finally, importantly, a Courageous Conservative by the Texas Conservative Coalition. Representative Workman served in the U.S. Army Reserves where he retired with the rank of Captain after 10 years of service. So, Ramon, I will let you take it. Thank you so much, Karen, and thank you to the Texas uh, Public Policy Foundation. And I just want to start by saying this forum is not about us up here. This forum is about you. This forum is about what you can do if you decide to do so to change the direction of our country. Now, I was a House Committee Counsel for 14 years, and I'm still trying to get over that. <laughs> I was Newt Gingrich's first Committee Counsel in 1989. And let me tell you, we thought we were going to change the world, but we didn't. Because Washington is its own world. The people who come to Washington come seeking power. And try getting politicians in Washington to give away power is an extraordinarily difficult exercise. And you're here because you understand that. You understand, I think, that the challenge of the next generation of limited government conservatives is not what do we do with the power in Washington, not who gets power in Washington, but how do we take power out of Washington and give it back to the people. And that's what all of us share in common. And that's what we're trying to figure out here today is what is the best way to do it. Now, I'm a football fan. So when you're running a football team, you got quarterbacks that can throw the long pass, you got short passes, and you got backfield that can take a ball through the line. And all of us have different strategies. Some of it's the long pass, some of it's short yardage, and we need to do them all. Because no one strategy can accomplish all of the change that we need. And I'm here to talk about a very, very specific problem that can't wait five years, for, which is the time it might take to call and hold a convention. It needs to be solved right now in the next two to three years. And that's the problem of federal regulation. Now, how many of you were here and heard Governor Abbott this morning ask us what the three best ideas would be to stop federal overregulation. How many of you heard Governor, Governor Abbott talk about that? So what the other side wants to do is talk about the great regulations that they're proposing and the unpopular people they want to regulate. What we should be talking about is the fact that their strategy is to empower regulators to dictate to the American people without their consent. That's the strategy that regulators use. And if we make that the issue, we can put them on the defensive, we can win. We can change the process. Now, every single Republican in the United States House of Representatives in 2013 voted for something called the RAINS Act to require that major federal regulations be approved by Congress. What a great idea. But of course, the President's not going to sign it. We don't have the strength to override a veto, so it's not going to happen. So the team that I work with has come up with a constitutional solution. Now, 
you're going to hear a debate about whether or not we should hold a convention or whether we should do nothing. But there is a third alternative which could produce results in a very short time frame. And it is the alternative that the states used 200 years ago to get the Bill of Rights passed. They didn't have to hold a convention. All the states had to do was let Congress know that two-thirds of them wanted some amendments, and if Congress didn't do it, well, they might end up with a convention. And Congress proposed the Bill of Rights. And just 50 years ago, Congress proposed presidential term limits. Same reason, because they understood that if the states agreed, they were going to have to do it one way or another. So what the Madison Coalition has done is worked with a team which now includes two governors, a bipartisan coalition of 150 state legislators. Um, include, there are many Democrats who are as concerned about regulations as we are. Our legal support includes the general counsel of the Republican National Committee and three former general counsels. We have a former chairman of the National Ri uh, Rifle Association. We have a former chairman of the Republican Federated Women. Uh, we have a former Democratic uh, chairman of a major state legislative organization. And all of them support something called the Regulation Freedom Amendment. And the Regulation Freedom Amendment is very simple. It just says that if a quarter of the members of the U.S. House or the U.S. Senate object to any federal regulation, then that regulation doesn't go into effect unless a majority of both houses of Congress approve it. So now, regulations would have the consent of the governed, just like laws. Now, you can imagine how some people who love regulations react when you ask them, well, do you think regulators ought to be dictators? Or do you think regulations ought to have the consent of the governed? Well, they don't want to answer that question because they don't want to admit that their strategy for ruling the country is ruling it without our consent. So as this movement grows, even before we get an amendment, we create an issue that unites our team. It unites social conservatives, economic conservatives, libertarian conservatives, Second Amendment conservatives, with a lot of moderates and independents who just don't believe that regulators should be dictating. It unites us, and it divides the supporters who think that regulators ought to run the world. So that's what we get when we build a movement. Now, how do we get this done? We, our first step, is introducing regulation, uh, resolutions in the 31 states with Republican majorities right now in the legislature and in several states where we have Democrats who are as angry as regulators as we are. And if we can pass those resolutions in 34 states, we've established a community of two-thirds of the states that agree on an amendment. And our second step is to pass laws in these states, and five states have already passed these laws, that would give the states the power to threaten Congress, if they ever wanted to do it, with a convention limited to an up or down vote on a single amendment. So they can go to Congress and say, either propose our amendment, or we're going to force you to call a convention that's going to propose it our way. And that's why Congress will propose the amendment. And so, What's your role? There are 4,000 legislators around the country who would love to take power out of Washington, but they don't know that there's a way to do it. And you can tell them. You can talk to grassroots groups. You can talk to business groups. You can talk to legislators. In Texas, Representative Phil King is introducing our resolution. He's the national chairman of ALEC. We have the National Chairman of Council of State Governments and NCSL doing it in their states. I spoke to Governor Abbott this morning. He said, it's a brilliant idea. So I'll close by saying, you can have an impact on the future of this country. Help us force Congress to propose the Regulation Freedom Amendment. My phone number is 202-255-5000. You have the information there. Call me, email me. I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for being here today. So I'm from California, the Lost Coast, right? So it's always inspiring to be in Texas. Texas is always coming home for people who love freedom. 
This is the heart and soul of freedom in America. It's why I come here so often. Because you come to Texas and you leave with your lungs full of the fresh air of liberty. And that's what Article 5 is all about. It's all about liberty, right? So America is an idea. It's more than just a nation. It's about an idea. And that idea, that simple idea, is a single word. It's called liberty. And it's best represented by a story from American history. I'll tell you a very short version of it. There was a historian traveling around the America, uh, United States of America in 1843. His name's Mellon Chamberlain. And he was trying to collect the stories of the last remaining Minutemen, the guys that actually fought in the American Revolution. He wanted to understand what brought them out on the field of battle. Imagine these were farmers and merchants, just simple people going out against the greatest fighting force ever assembled. And he happened to cross Captain Levi Preston in North Carolina. Preston at the time is roughly 91 years of age. He fought in the battles at Lexington and Concord. One of the original Minutemen in Chamberlain asks him, Captain Preston, what brought you out to the field to battle that day? Was it the oppression of the British? Was it the Stamp Act? You were so frustrated having to buy those stamps and put them on all your documents. And he said, stamps? I never saw no stamps. We heard the governor locked them up in the armory. That's the last we ever heard of it. He says, well, then it must have been the tea, the tax on tea. You were outraged. He said, son, we're farmers. We never drank no tea. I mean, we heard the boys dumped it in the harbor, but that was the end of that. And he goes to the great writers and he said, were you reading Burke and the great revolutionaries? You understood the theory of revolution. And he said, never heard of them. We read the Bible, Psalms, Almanac, Catechism. That's about all we knew about reading. And he said, okay, well, maybe it was just British tyranny, the heavy hand of British tyranny, the boot on your neck. And he said, we didn't know any British tyranny. And he said, well, then why did you fight? What brought you out to the battle that day? You had everything to lose. And he said, son, when we went out to fight that, the Redcoats that day, we meant only one thing. We had always governed ourselves, and we always intended to. And them Redcoats, they intended that we shouldn't. I would say that today we find ourselves in a similar circumstance. Today, you in this room here in Texas especially, we intend to govern ourselves. And I'm telling you right now, them people in Washington, D.C., they intend that we shouldn't. And we've got to do something about that. Fantastically, the founders gave us a gift, an amazing gem hidden away in Article 5 of the Constitution. The second clause of Article 5, not inserted until the last two days of convention. George Mason stands and he says, gentlemen, we have a fundamental problem. We've given Congress the right to amend the Constitution should they find that the federal government becomes a tyranny, but we've not given it to the people. And can you imagine Congress proposing amendments to restrain its own tyranny? Of course not, right? This is why they won't pass the amendments themselves. And the wisdom was profound then as it is today, and Madison's notes reflect there was not a moment of debate. It was unanimous, and one of the few things unanimously adopted into the Constitution was our right as sovereign citizens to act through our states to tell the federal government, we've had enough. Does that sound pretty good? Yeah. So we have the power to do this. We're given this power, and we can do it, and we will do it, and we are doing it. The Convention of States Project is organized nationally. We're operating in every state around the country. The application for the convention, and it's a convention for the purpose of, of restraining the federal government's scope, power, and jurisdiction. That one sends a tingle up my leg, as Chris Matthews would say. <laughs> for imposing fiscal restraints, in other words, you could pass a balanced budget amendment under the Convention of States application, or for imposing term limits. Now, these are things that most Americans just nod and say, yeah, we're in favor of those things. So this is what the application is about. And people say, a convention, that sounds so big, it could take so long. Well, as Ramon just said, we've got 31 legislatures now under the complete control of Republicans. You have split houses where you have Democrats supporting the Convention of States Initiative. Today, as we speak, 34 states are prepared to file the legislation for the Convention of States Initiative. We've already passed it in Florida, Georgia, and Alaska. That takes us beyond the threshold, and we expect to have legislation filed in at least 37 states in the coming session. That's pretty extraordinary, don't you guys think? The political landscape in America is changing, and our job is to recognize that change and to be ahead of that curve and to act when the time to act comes. The time to act is now. Levi Preston stepped on the field of battle because the time to act was now. It was right then, in that moment, and this is our moment. 
31 states in control of Republicans, we can get this done right now. It's not as difficult as people want to make it sound. Roman talked about five years. I'm not interested in five years. I'm too old for five years. The country doesn't have five years. I'm saying right now, this year, this session, 2015, we're going to get to 34 states and call a convention. How's that sound? So, look, it doesn't happen without you guys. You know, there's this incredibly unique role for legislators like Representative Workman to play. Unbelievably, the federal government actually, in that federal charter, in the Constitution, gave state legislators the power over the federal government. Most people have no idea this power even exists. Right there in the charter, it says that if the federal government gets out of hand, you guys, the men and women of the state legislatures, have got to restrain that government. It's amazing. Mark Levin said recently at ALEC, talking to a huge group of conservative legislators from all over the country, that the, our state legislators are the last line of defense for liberty. The last line of defense. This is it. We live in a post-constitutional republic. Our Constitution has been changed so dramatically by Congress and supported by the Supreme Court that it would be unrecognizable to the founders. Thank God, and I do mean thank God, that the founders were given the wisdom to put that second clause of Article 5 in, to give us the opportunity to go to our state legislators, to work with our state legislators, and to help them be the heroes they were meant to be in this circumstances. Because make no mistake, the heroes that save this country will be the citizens, but not without the courage and strength of their state legislators. So we are getting it done. It's passed in three states. We have it introducing in 34 states, as I said. It'll be upwards of 37. We're going to get it done right here in Texas. Now, Texas should have been first in the nation, but y'all weren't in session last year. Right? So we're going to forgive you for that for last year. But this year, we're hoping and expecting and praying that you guys will lead the nation as we go to convention in 2015. How can you guys participate? Well, you heard Tamara Colbert's in the back of the room here. We've got a bunch of folks from the San Antonio Tea Party here that are helping out. You've got a bunch of district captains from all over Texas that are helping out. Tamara can answer your questions and help you get started. You can go to conventionofstates.com. There you can sign the petition. That petition will automatically go to your state legislator. You could sign up to be a volunteer to help us. It's not only we can get it done, it's not only we need to get it done, it is that in 2015, you are going to make history and you are going to call the first convention of states in United States history. Thank you very much. God bless you. Well, that's kind of a tough act to follow, don't you think? <laughs> well, it's very nice to be here in the state of Texas. Uh, my brother moved here after college, and he's lived in Dallas uh, pretty much his whole adult life. Uh, it's, it seems to be that uh, pretty soon the whole country is going to be moving to Texas. <laughs> and uh, I hear you guys have room for everybody here, too. We just don't want them bringing the laws with them that uh, made them leave in the first place, right? Yeah, that's what happens. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here. I thought I would just start off uh, a little bit by saying how, um, uh, con how much I am concerned uh, about the future of this country. I'm sure that's why we have a standing room only uh, crowd in here. I don't think that a uh, program on an Article 5 uh, convention to propose amendments to the Constitution would dra attract such a crowd unless we were in serious, serious trouble. I don't want to sound like Harold Hill, Harold, but uh, we are in serious, <laughs> serious trouble. Um, and I think there's no one here on the program, no one here on the dais, who thinks that there's only one solution to the problem that we have. Um, first of all, I think there, what's very important is elections. Um, it's elections uh, that gave control of Congress uh, to the Republicans, and I think that's going to put a break uh, on some of the terrible things that have been happening in D.C. Um, but we know from experience that we cannot count on congressional Republicans to do the job that we need them to do to limit the power of the federal government. They've had that power before. They haven't come through for us before. It's going to be a whole lot better than it was when the Democrats controlled it when it comes to federal power, but it's still not going to fix the problem and things are not going to be rolled back. There's a place for lawsuits, like the lawsuit that I was involved with challenging the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And we made some good law there uh, on the limits of federal power, but Chief Justice Roberts found a way to rewrite the law 
uh, so that he could uphold it, even, even though the law we were objecting to he found to be unconstitutional. He rewrote the law so it wasn't the law we were objecting to and upheld that one instead. Um, that was, we didn't expect that. Um, so lawsuits can't do it either. They can't do all of it, although I think lawsuits are important. I mean, I don't spend all my time talking about Article 5. I spend a lot of my time uh, talking about elections and talking about lawsuits. That's really my job. Uh, but I have gotten interested in Article 5, and here's how I got interested in it. Um, several years ago, after, after the election of 2008, I noticed uh, that a lot of um, state representatives were passed, state houses were passing what they called state sovereignty resolutions. And I got calls from a lot of reporters asking me about what these state sovereignty resolutions were good for. And these were resolutions passed by the houses of both, both houses of a state house that basically said we are a sovereign state and Congress cannot do X, Y, and Z. And I said the problem with these resolutions is they had no legal standing whatsoever. Uh, they are s merely platitudinous. It's a way actually for state legislators to avoid the responsibility of doing something about the problem by passing a symbolic measure that has no legal effect and that they know has no legal effect. And so I said to those reporters, and this was really the first time I started thinking about it, um, spontaneously while I was on the phone, I said, look, if the state legislators actually want to do something about what's going on in Washington, there is a power that the Constitution does give them, and it is in Article 5. And it says that when two-thirds of state legislatures uh, vote to, ha to call for Congress to have an, uh, a convention for purposes of, of proposing amendments, then Congress shall call that convention. And this is a power that the framers of the Constitution resided, it, located in state legislators. It's just like the Electoral College. State legislators run the Electoral College. They're the ones that organize state elections. They're the ones that send electors to federal government. They, state legislators make the rules by which the electors get sent. That's their constitutional power under the Constitution. And this is another one of those powers. The difference is this is one that has not been used. Um, this is one that has not been used by state legislators. And so it is, we've grown unfamiliar with it. It seems kind of uh, different and threatening. So this is what I proposed that people start using this. And I thought, well, look, if I'm going to tell state legislators they ought to be doing something like this, maybe I ought to come up with an idea for what they ought to be proposing by way of an amendment. And I wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal uh, called In Defense of a Federalism Amendment, in which I wrote a single amendment which would attempt to limit federal power. You know, it was an op-ed in the newspaper. It got more fee I got more feedback from that op-ed than any other Wall Street Journal or other op-ed I'd ever written. Um, but uh, and then as a result of that, I got, call, I got invited onto a, uh, a Tea Party internet television show um, by Michael Patrick Leahy, who was, who was hosting it in those days. And he asked me about this amendment, and, and I said to him, well, look, you know, Michael, this is something I spent a few days working on. It's not like I'd spent that much time on it. Um, he said, well, how long would it take you to do something, you know, for real, for serious? And I said, well, maybe a month or two. He goes, we'll have you back. Uh, on the show and you can come up with something. So then the onus was on me. And what I ended up coming up with was a bill of federalism, 10 amendments that I had gleaned from other people's work and I actually had vetted on a website that we'd set up, 10 amendments to, uh, to restore constitutional federalism in this country. In some respects, very similar to what Mark Levin did in his wonderful book, The Liberty Amendments. And Mark is a friend of mine and I've been on his show to talk about Article 5 conventions. So I proposed this and I thought, well, the, the idea here was is that if we put all these good ideas together, some was about for a balanced budget, some was for a line item veto, some was for term limits, some was for funding unfunded mandates, make sure there was no imposed, it would have 10 amendments then we get in a coalition together behind this change. But what I found was that when you specify 10 different proposals like that, everyone liked their proposal, and then they didn't like the other guy's proposal, and as a result, no coalition was formed. What ended up happening is that one of those amendments got selected out by the Virginia Tea Party. It was the repeal amendment, and the repeal amendment would have given um, and it got introduced into both houses of Congress, as a matter of fact. The repeal amendment would have given a, a majority of the states, representing a majority of the popula population, the power to repeal any federal law or regulation. And I think, I still think that's a really good idea. But, the pro but I actually was at a meeting um, uh, with your senator, Ted Cruz, before he was senator. We were just at a strategy session after the 2008 election. And I, s I took him aside and I said, what do you think about the repeal amendment? And I was saying, we, you know, can we ask for your support on this? He wasn't even in elected politics at that time. And his response to me was actually kind of interesting. He said, you know, it simply doesn't do enough. And I, I said, I like this man right here. I like this man. 
This is the only thing he could have said to me that would have brought me up short from, from, my, from my proposal. You know, it simply doesn't do enough. And that gives rise to the problem we have today. Many of the proposals that you hear about, you state legislators have heard about and others have heard about, like a balanced budget amendment and other sorts of amendments, just don't do enough. And Ted's instinct was that if we're going to go through all the trouble of having a convention to propose amendments, we ought to have a convention that has a scope that's capable of taking on the problems that we have. And that's what I think the convention of the state scope is. And let me read you what the call for a convention is that's being proposed by Mark and the group that he leads. It says, the application um, proposes for the calling of a convention of the states limited to proposing amendments to the Constitution of the United States that impose fiscal, fiscal restraints on the federal government, limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and limit the terms of office for its officials and for members of Congress. These are general uh, subject matter that the convention would be limited to this subject matter. Any, any amendment that was germane would be in order. And every one of you who's a legislator knows that there are rules of order and there are parliamentarians that say what's in order and what's not in order. And anything that's germane to this would be ruled in order and anything that was not germane would be ruled out of order. Balanced budget would be in order. Ten term limits for different officials would be in order. And then we would have a deliberation, uh, which is really what we need. We need a deliberation. We actually need a gap gathering of our finest individuals who will get together and hammer these things out. It's not like you can just write these. I, I learned through bitter experience. You can't just write these things yourself. You do need help. You do need collaboration. And you need legislative drafters, which every legislator has access to. So for this reason, I support this movement. Uh, I didn't get a chance to, my time is up, I didn't get a chance to talk about the biggest fear that people have, which is that there might be a runaway convention. I think this is a, a, it's a complete misunderstanding of what happened in history, and it's a misunderstanding of what can happen in the future, but I'll leave that for the Q&A. I'm sure somebody will have, somebody will ask about that. Thanks. <laughs> Well, I was trying to get up without falling off, have these conservative guys here pushing me even further to the right <laughs> than I already am. You know, um, when I got elected four years ago, I, I, was, I was and I'm still very much interested in our state and making sure that our state is a healthy place uh, for us to live and work and raise our families. But I remember thinking at the time, what, what can a state legislator do about the federal government? How can I or any of my colleagues make a difference in what happens in Washington? And I confess that for a while, I, I just like, well, I guess there's nothing we can do. We just have to sit here and take it. And in fact, the state legislatures around our nation for years have simply done that. We have just sat back and accepted whatever was passed down from Washington. I personally think it happened when the 17th Amendment was passed. And I wasn't here in the teens. Probably few of you were, but, and I'm sure there were, there were real issues with how we elected our uh, senators at the time, and it, it obviously at the time seemed like the thing to do, but what happened was the state legislatures no longer had a voice in Congress. And so when I, I kept thinking about what it is that we could do as legislators, and I've got so a number of my colleagues here today that are very interested in this subject. I came across Article 5. I can't remember exactly now where I found it. One of my deals, uh, Professor Barnett's got a copy of the Cato Institute uh, Declaration of Independence and Constitution. I've given out over 5,000 of those, by the way. And I was reading that and came across Article 5 and started talking about it. And I, I asked, started asking my colleagues, have you ever heard of Article 5? No, what's that? And these were legislators who didn't know 
what was in Article 5 of our Constitution. I started reading about it more and more and trying to figure out what we could do. And so I've kind of taken on this as something that, as a state legislator and a legislature, we can do to affect what's going on in our nation. And believe me, we better do something pretty dang quick. So, um, first of all, let me talk about where Texas is in this process. In 1977, an all-democratic legislature with a Democratic governor passed an amendment, a resolution making application to the U.S. Congress for a, an amendment to the Constitution for a fiscal responsibility bill, balanced budget, if you will. It simply says that the Congress can't spend more than it takes in. That application in 1977 is still active today and is being used and is being counted among the states that have done so. There are 24 such applications uh, in the country that are active and for this particular amendment. And so we are 10 away from having enough to force the Congress to call a convention on that particular subject. There are a lot of other subjects out there, great subjects. Professor Barnett mentioned three, and Mr. Meckler has mentioned several. There are a lot of good subjects. Many of those have got just a couple of states that have done something. The balanced budget amendment is much further along, and we're hopeful that we can get far enough along that we can actually get close enough to force Congress to act. So one of the things that I've discovered as I've talked about and learned about Article 5 is that if you read the Article 5, it's there's not much there other than the states can do it. There's no procedure about how many states it takes to, I mean, how a state uh, selects its delegates, how those delegates are to act. It's not even in there whether or not it's one state, one vote, or proportional. None of that's in the, in the Article 5 Convention. There are some historical precedents, I think, which set out that it's one state, one vote situation, and so that's probably the way that'll go. So I found out about a, a group out of, uh, started out in Mount Vernon called Mount Vernon Assembly. It's been changed now to the Assembly of State Legislature. I've been to two of those meetings and that group is specifically designed to try to come up with the rules under which a, a convention would be operated so that we don't get to 34, get a convention call, and then can't even decide how we're gonna operate. So we're working on that. This particular group is working on a set of rules that would be model legislation for the states to come up with and hopefully pass. Indiana actually, by the way, has already passed such rules, and they're kind of the basis from which everything is happening. And uh, Representative Phil King, who was mentioned earlier, is intending to file the legislation that is similar to the uh, Indiana legislation for the state of Texas, which will outline how we select our delegates and how those delegates are to act when they get there. So I'm hopeful that we can get that done in this legislative session. So what are we gonna do this session? We have, we have already drafted four uh, resolutions to, to cover various things. One of them is a reaffirmation of the 1977 uh, amendment, uh, application. We're going to go back and we're going to reaffirm the fact that we want to have this balanced budget amendment. We've also got the uh, uh, resolution which calls for the three uh, different subjects that were mentioned earlier. There's also a thing out there called a compact for a balanced budget amendment. If you've not heard about that, this is an attempt to roll the whole thing together into a single piece of legislation and get it passed by 38 states so that you get 38 states and you're kind of done. So that was, uh, that's, that's going on as well. So I want to mention a little bit about the Runaway Convention because this is what I hear most from the people who push back on it, and they're concerned about a Runaway Convention. I don't share that concern whatsoever. This is a Mount Everest task. It is a very high hurdle. It is very easy to take it off the rails. So if something were, if we were to have a convention 
and in, in some way the, a, a, uh, an amendment arose that, that we don't like as liberty-loving people, it only takes 13 legislative bodies around the country to kill it. And yet it takes 76 legislative bodies, 75 if Nebraska is on board, to pass something. So the hurdle is very high. And so for those that are concerned about a runaway convention, know this. I believe that a convention that is called will be called for a specific purpose. I believe that Texas certainly will, and I believe that most of the states will pass legislation which will direct their delegates not to get off the rails, not to stray from the con convention call. Further, I believe that Congress would not recognize any such amendment that came out of a convention that was not subject to the, f to the call. So I think there's a lot of safeguards there, and I don't want to, um, I don't want anyone to be concerned about the runaway convention. It just isn't going to happen. So I look forward to working on that this session. I've got colleagues here that won't work with me on it, and we're going to get something done in the state of Texas and have Texas have an impact on our national policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, and you can see why there's a level of enthusiasm in this room as we respond to what we know is a two-year window where we have opportunity to work and to work hard, but we have a lot of recruiting to do. Um, I'd like, and Ken Ivory, is that Representative Ivory that just came in over there? Oh, yeah, I okay, I thought so. Um, he, I'm moderating a panel tomorrow morning, but Representative Ivory, if you don't know him yet, he's from Utah, but is the father of federalism and probably is personally responsible for energizing the sense that states have to come to a sense of defense of what is important about their authority and their sovereignty. And so um, he's kind of a rock star among those of us who are working very hard to bring states together, knowing that states now have to act as a band of brothers, so to speak, to defend and declare what their rights are and, and what their privileges are under the Tenth Amendment. So I did want to start, we'll do questions in one minute, but I wanted to ask Professor Barnett, and by the way, I do quote Professor Barnett in my little piece that's on your um, seats there, but when it comes to the idea of a runaway convention, Ilyas Shapiro from Cato has written about this, Professor Barnett has commented on it, and I wanted to make sure that we get his thoughts in before I move to Q&A. Thanks, Karen. Um, a number of things. First of all, to reiterate what, uh, what Representative Workman just said, um, the, the number one safeguard against a runaway convention um, is that nothing, all, this, all a convention of the states can do is propose amendments. It's, all, it's the only power they have is to propose amendments. It's the same power Congress has today. Congress is a runaway convention now, <laughs> but they're just not proposing amendments to limit their own power. So that's the only power a convention has. The only way any of these, convention, uh, any of these proposals become law is if three-quarters of the states then ratify them. So this is a convention for proposing amendments. That's the first thing I would say. That's, that's the number one safeguard the founders put in the text itself. Secondly, you've, nobody should ever refer to this as a constitutional convention. This was actually a term that was come up with that, uh, by people who opposed an Article V movement in the past. It's not, it's not what the Constitution authorizes. It does not authorize a constitutional convention. It authorizes a convention for proposing amendments. That's what it authorizes. That's what the text says. Only amendments, a convention proposing amendments. If you want to call it something a shorthand, call it an amends, amendments convention. But it is not a constitutional convention. So that's the second thing. The third thing is that it's a myth to say that the Philadelphia Convention that gave us our Constitution was itself a runaway convention. It was not. Uh, for at least two different reasons. One is because the mandate that each one of those state representatives had was a broad mandate to address the serious problems that were in the country at that time, and that would have included a radical change of the kind they ultimately proposed. But the other thing that was different with what came out of the Philadelphia Convention, which was a constitutional convention, turned into one, uh, and that is that Really, it required a unanimous vote of everyone. No state was bound by the new convention unless they agreed to be bound by the new con I'm sorry, no state was bound by the proposed constitution unless they agreed to. Now, it's true the constitution went into effect when three-quarters of the states agreed to do it, but the remaining quarter were not in 
In fact, two states remain out. North Carolina and Rhode Island stayed out of the out of the uh, uh, of the uh, Constitution for a period, a couple years, until they until they finally voted in. So it really was completely a different animal whatsoever than an amendments convention that's authorized according to the text of the Constitution. Um, so and and then of course there is the fact that it is a convention of the states. And a convention of the states is a creature of the states, to be administered and run by the states. And that has been our constitutional history. We have a history of, of conventions that, that pre-existed the Constitution. That's why it was put in here. And we've had, a, we've had regional conventions since then. And these are conventions that make their own rules. The state legislatures themselves make the rules. Um, and that's what would happen here. And fortunately, uh, with the, what's the, the, um, what's the name of the organ? What is it? Assembly of state the Assembly of State Legislators are working to ensure agreement amongst uh, states as to what the rules would be. Okay, questions? Yes, right here in the front. Representative Workman, I'd like to ask you, I, I, I appreciate what you said and that you're going to be working to get this through. My question to you is if the present speaker is there, are you going to be able to get something done? I don't think there's any question about it. I've already um, visited with the speaker. He's supportive of these ideas. I don't think there'll be any question, but we'll be able to get that done. Okay, over on this side. Um, love the idea of an Article 5 convention. I've spark, spoken to Mark LeMint about it, and Paul has spoken with Phil King about it. You've all acknowledged that we're running out of time. And in the absence of this happening, it seems like the only other remedy that we have is to go to the courts, and it seems like the federal courts is a place where states go to lose rights and to give up liberty. And we've seen states have stood up to the federal government through interposition and nullification. Is that a possibility in the absence of this happening? Is interposition, and we've seen it happen states with Colorado and different states through marijuana and Second Amendment laws, would you support that? Well, I'll just speak for myself. Um, I don't agree that states have a power of nullification. I know there's a, uh, there are people who disagree, uh, the, who advocate that they do. I don't believe they do. I don't think James Madison thought they did. Um, there was, there, we all know the history of the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. Uh, but in fact, when Radisson wrote his report of 1800, in which he defended the, con the, the propriety of the Virginia Resolution, uh, which was a resolution to object to the constitutionality of the Aliens and Sedition Act that had been enacted by the Federalists in Congress at the behest of the Adams administration, when Madison went to defend that pr proposition in his famous report of, 18 of 1800, he basically said that, what gave sta this, that states had the right to express their opinion about the constitutionality of a matter just like anyone else did. Um, and in fact, he called upon, it, what the resolutions did was called upon other states to interpose their opinion against the constitutionality, but, it was, but he denied that it would have a legal or what he would call a juridical effect, uh, that there actually literally was a power of nullification. Uh, so I just don't, I, 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 you know, there were other people at the time, later on in the 19th century, thought there was a power of nullification, but I'm prepared to side with Madison on this. One of the authors of one of the most famous resolutions, the Virginia Resolution, who denied that there was such a power of, of, of nullification. So for me, it's a non-starter. It's not part of our constitutional system. Representative Toth wanted to thank you for your service and leadership as he's been in the legislature. Okay, another question. Yes, back in the back. So I guess we're down to resolution. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If you could please stand, people can't hear you, so. I can repeat your question. Okay, they sure can't. They won't be able to hear me anyway or see me either. But anyhow, what my question is. He's got a mic for you. Okay. Ooh. Okay. Well, my question is. Now you got to be good. I'm going to try. <laughs> yeah, now the spotlight's on me. Okay. What I'm concerned about, I'm not worried about a runaway convention. I believe this is where we got to go. We don't have any alternative. We need to. I'm more worried about the runaway president that we have up in Washington. W Tell me something. Maybe I'm, this is just far-fetched and it's my imagination going wild, but what is to stop him from saying, because we're doing this, that we're being anarchist and shut us down and then take, our way, take away our rights to have elections? Sounds like a constitutional scholar question. <laughs> well, 
we're seeing a lot of um, presidential discretion being exercised, and it's and a, there's a I mean there's a lot I mean with executive orders and other sorts of things, and people are are very upset, and I think rightly upset about the inability to practically speaking control an executive when they decide to act this way. And in fact, one of the reasons why we have a republic is because our executives have tended to act, act with restraint. I mean, we had a two-year, a two-term limit set by President Washington that didn't get violated until FDR. Um, so it was a tradition, and it got violated, then it got corrected by a constitutional amendment. So that's what I'd say is what's necessary here. Uh, we, can't, we can't rely on the President. Um, we can't rely on the Congress. Um, the kinds of proposals that would be proposed at a convention of the state would address these sorts of problems. The Constitution is not perfect. And here is where you see some evidence of where the Constitution is not perfect. President has a duty to take care that all laws be faith that the laws be faithfully executed. What happens when he breaches that duty? Well, it may be that the only remedy for that is impeachment, but impeachment may not be a politically viable alternative. As long as the President has supporters of his own party in Congress that are sufficient to block that remedy, there is no remedy. That is not a good thing about the Constitution, but it's one of the things that needs to be fixed. So um, the Constitution is a wonderful document. If actually, I know every, I think I speak for all of us, is that if the entire Constitution as currently written was being followed by those in the federal government, we would not be up here proposing changes. <laughs> so I'm not criticizing the Constitution per se, but it's not being followed. And then the only question is what power can you exert to try to influence the future direction of the federal government. And it just so happens, I mean, there's lots of powers. One is the courts, the other is political elections. There are powers to exert. Among those powers is the power reposed in state legislators to change the Constitution, to rein in the federal government. And this is a program it's just simply about that one lever of power that the Constitution gives us that we need to exercise. I want to back that up with a, an activist and political answer. So you got the, the legal answer from the scholar, the guy who understands the Constitution. The practical answer is that this movement is a movement of the people. And Representative Workman described it correctly. It's climbing Mount Everest. It's huge. And as you move towards the to convention, the political muscle, the sheer activist organizing muscle that is required to get this done is massive. And we're currently operating in all 50 states. I can tell you it's a massive operation and undertaking. So what happens is the bigger that operation and undertaking gets, the more people that sign on, the more people are involved, the more PR it gets, the harder it becomes for the federal government to resist. And in fact, politicians, I would argue, not the ones in this room, but I would argue a lot of them in Washington, D.C., they're not leaders. They tend to be followers. And they're sniffing the political wind. And what you're going to see as the movement grows is the guys who might have stood against are going to start saying, you know what? I've been for this Article 5 thing longer than anybody else. <laughs> and we're going to welcome him on board the train. That's, but that's the way politics works. And, and I want you to remember what's happening in this movement right now. It's so important because we, we're talking about it in this room in an isolated environment. But remember now, endorsing the Article 5 movement right now, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Glenn Beck, Mark Levin, Sarah Palin, many of them specifically endorsing Convention of States. Your newest resident here in Texas, Colonel Allen West, I'm proud to say, right? All these people, Governor Bobby Jindal, Mike Lee, Senator Rand Paul, Senator Tom Coburn coming on board to help Convention of States. So what you have is this massive movement of public opinion taking place at a very high influencer level. And people in Washington, D.C., they don't take that kind of stuff lightly. Let me also add, and this is a good question about the presidential powers in this. He's not mentioned in Article 5 whatsoever. So if there's, a, if there's an Article 5 convention and an amendment proposed, and that amendment goes to the states and is ratified the state, by the states, the president has nothing to say about it. It becomes <laughs> law. So. That, that's a really good point. And also, just so you know, governors of the states have nothing to say about it either. Right. This so. is simply a matter for state legislators, both houses, if you have a two-house state, uh, not the governor. I would just add I would just add one other thing and that is that we know that it's going to take some time to get 34 states to call a convention. We might get it this year, might not. It's going to take time. Then it's going to take time to get Congress to propose to call the convention. 
And then what we also know is it's going to take about two to two and a half years for the courts to litigate all the arguments that are going to be made about a convention. Now, it's possible the court could accelerate that, but they didn't for Obamacare. And so we're looking at a time frame that might be longer than we want to get a convention convened. And that's why to deal with the specific problem that you talked about, which is the president's abuse of his executive power, we are doing the parallel strategy of getting 34 states to agree on a specific amendment and then force Congress to propose it and force our opponents to admit that what they want to, want to do is rule this country by regulation. And so the parallel strategies, remember the long pass, the convention, the short over the line, forcing Congress to propose an amendment, that's the way we ought to be using Article 5. It's not just one strategy, it's multiple strategies. Back in the back. Is, is true that our founding fathers, when they wrote the Constitution, said this is a document for moral men. Is this, is this true? It's technically not a document that has any real teeth. So what you're saying is that we are in a, in a, in a climate of immorality and a, and a document that is not being followed or upheld. If we propose new amendments, what mechanisms do we have to impose morality in this time of immorality? I mean, part of it will depend on what the amendments are. If it's an amendment that requires judicial enforcement, which I'm afraid many of the balanced budget amendments are, then we are ba thrown back into the courts again to have the courts try to hold Congress's feet to the fire, and they don't like doing that, and they tend not to do that. But if the amendments are structural, uh, like, for example, just as an example, the repeal amendment that I talked about, which would give the legislators of a majority of the states representing a majority of the population the power to repeal any federal law or regulation, that would be a structural amendment. That would not be anything that courts would have to adjudicate on. It would be the same thing as saying that there are two houses of Congress. That's still, we're still, we still operate under these hardwired rules of the Constitution. They're the ones that are very difficult to get out of. Every, sen every state has two senators not three senators. There are a lot of uh, law, uh, law professors who think this is grossly unfair. Uh, states like Calif uh, California and Texas who have so, much, uh, so many more people really ought to have more senators, but they don't have more senators because the Constitution says two. So if the proposals that come out of such a convention, and if I were participating, I would urge this to be the case, were structural like this and not thou shalt not do X, it's the thou shalt not do X provisions that tend not to get enforced. And it's the structural ones, the checks and balances ones, the ones that Madison and others devised for us, they're the ones that have stuck with us and continue to to this day. You know, and I just want to just generally address the theme of what we're trying to do here. It's really important. We're really not trying to rewrite the Constitution. What we're doing, I would argue, is trying to re-found the country along its original principles. And if I had to describe what we're trying to do with this Article 5 Convention as simply as I can, if I had to create a single amendment, it would read like this. No, really, we meant it. <laughs> <laughs> because if we, you know, and well, it's already been set up here. If we were following the Constitution as written, most of these problems wouldn't exist. And so really what we're trying to do is create structural fixes. We've got a broken structure because of what the courts and Congress have done and the president. We're trying to restore the structure of self-governance in America. Well, I, but I want to be clear what the founders meant when they said that this was a constitution for a moral and religious people. They didn't mean the people in government. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that sincerely. There's plenty of writing about what they felt about people in public service, and they talked about balancing avarice and greed against avarice and greed, ambition against ambition. They understood human nature. What they meant more broadly is it's meant for a moral and religious nation. A, a moral and religious people. And I'll tell you, one of the things I push back against the hardest as I travel this country and hear people say, oh, we can't do this because we are now an immoral nation and we're stupid and we're not informed. And I'll tell you, I travel to every state in this country and everywhere I go, I find rooms full of people like this. People say there are no more Madisons and Adams and Washingtons. You know what? Some of them are sitting on the panel with me today. Some of them are in this room. Madison and Adams and Washington, the spirit of those people, the intellect of those people, the bravery of those people, the patriotism of those people lives 
and it's in every state and every city in this country right now. I promised I get back to this side of the room. Yes. All right. Um, I appreciate that uh, Dr. Barnett and uh, Mr. Meckler both have basically summarized it <coughs> excuse me, and said that uh, if the Constitution were abided by, as it's written, there wouldn't be a need for all of this. Uh, okay, and that's, that's my position, too. I, could, I, I was going to ask the question, what's wrong with the Constitution? Well, there really isn't anything wrong with the Constitution. It does not need amendments. We need a mechanism for enforcing the contract between the states which created the federal government and their, create, and their creature which they created. And that's, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Barnett, I would, I would hope that you might uh, uh, be open-minded enough to entertain the fact that the, the concept of state nullification of a federal act, either a legislative act, an executive order of the president, or a court decision, you know, preventing, pre preventing the pre-exercise of religion like prayer in schools, that any of those acts ought to be able to be declared unconstitutional by a proper state legislative and uh, judicial and, uh, you know, just get the, the state government to declare it unconstitutional. I'd like to mention that uh, uh, Dan Flynn, representative from Tyler area, has in, uh, introduced HB 98, and it deals explicitly with this nullification process. And I would encourage each person, uh, including a panel, to study that and see if there might not be some uh, nugget of, some little gold nugget of uh, value there perhaps as an alternative or to be done parallel with a quest for a conference. If I could grab the moderator's prerogative, or maybe I'm jumping outside of that, but to suggest real quickly that the idea is when a structure was built and our Constitution was provided, and yet part of it has been dismantled, then there is a need, a call now to reassert or to reinforce, to rebuild, just restore what was originally there. Do any comments from the panel on that question, Ramon? Sure. Thomas Jefferson said that if he could put one amendment in the Constitution, it would be to limit or prohibit the government's ability to borrow. So even Jefferson recognized that we might need changes. I think the authors of the Constitution would be astounded at the regulatory power that Congress has delegated to the executive branch. That's the result of a series of Supreme Court decisions over the last 50 years. And the Regulation Freedom Amendment is designed to solve that specific problem. Uh, there are many other specific problems that, as Mark said, can be solved not by saying do not do, but by restoring the balance between the executive branch, between the legislative branch, between the states, and the federal government. And I would just close by saying that if two-thirds of the states learn how they can force Congress to propose amendments or they can call a convention that will propose amendments, if they relearn that skill, we will have permanently restored a balance of power between the state and federal government, no matter who is in Washington and no matter who is in Austin. We might be able to fit in two more questions. Robert Croft, back on this side. Constitution is a contract, right? An agreement of the states. And so the issue is it's a compound republic waking up the states. So, Mr. Workman, how how can we? Uh, what do, what's it going to take to get legislators to wake up to the real power that they hold? We have to move quickly. What, what would it take to encourage your your fellow legislators? Well, I think uh, education is going to be the start. I mean, we've got to make sure that everybody understands. Uh, what's there and and you know as I confessed the first period of my time as a legislator and for the years prior to that it, the assumption was that the federal government ruled but we just did whatever they told us to do and we're finding out that's not the case and so it'll be it'll be you talking to your legislators uh, telling them that wait a minute you need to wake up and you need to make sure you're pushing back against the federal government because they are out of control. And I think that's what it's going to take. Last question right here, quickly. Uh, I have a lot of problems when I'm talking to the MSNBC crowd about they'll get back to me. It's living, our Constitution is a living document. And I try, I'm not convinced what I'm telling them is hidden gray matter. And one thing, that's the point. We're the wrong place. One thing. <laughs> Yeah, 
A constant. This is something that Ed Meese once told me. A constitution that is not followed is a dead constitution. A, only a constitution that's followed is a living constitution. So we, we, what we need to do is use the powers that the Constitution gave state legislators to get Congress to follow the rest of the Constitution. That's all that's being argued for up here. You, following the procedures in Article 5 to get Congress to make amendments to force Congress to follow the rest of the procedures in the Constitution. And so that is the definition of a living Constitution. That is a perfect and profound note to end on. Please join me in thanking our panel.